Kitco News special coverage of Masari's annual Mainit Summit is brought to you by Oasis Pro. Hello, I'm Michelle McCory. We are at the Masari Mainnet Conference in New York City, where leaders in the DeFi and crypto sector have gathered, including Mike Belshi, CEO of BitGo. Mike, good to have you with us. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, we have a lot to discuss, but let's start off with an overview. So BitGo, one of the leaders in digital asset security and custody, one in three exchanges, I believe, use a form of the BitGo wallet. Why don't we start off for our viewers that are not familiar with BitGo, with just a general background of the company. Sure, sure, sure. So, like, BitGo is a little bit behind the scenes from where retail customers might be. Uh, we've been offering services to businesses and institutions for now over 10 years. So we're one of the oldest firms in the space. And we pioneered, you know, really working on the technology, some of the security behind what's used across the globe at exchanges and brokerages and payment processors today. So. That was multi-signature uh, quite some time ago. It still is multi-signature on a number of blockchains. Uh, we also have expanded that into MPC and other forms of security. But at the base layer, it's about security. Above that, uh, I guess about seven or eight years ago, we, we entered into the regulatory foray. Um, and we are a qualified custodian. We actually own four custodians around the globe, expanding with two more coming in Asia, hopefully by the end of this year. Um, but adding kind of that regulatory component on top of what we do. This allows us to interface with another type of businesses that need a fiduciary to help with the storage of assets. So even though you don't see us on the retail fronts, we're actually probably the largest wallet uh, in the world um, in terms of we're working businesses. They take the frontline interface to retail, to consumers, and then uh, it's our wallet's behind the scenes. So dealing mostly with institutional clients and investors, what are you seeing in terms of demand with regards to any particular assets in the digital space, any particular cryptocurrencies? Where is the most demand coming from these days? Well, right now the demand is down everywhere. Um, people sometimes call it crypto winter, but that's actually not where we're at at all. Where we're at is like a massive global crypto, uh, global economic winter, which is of course affecting higher risk assets like, like uh, Bitcoin and, and digital assets. If you do break it down, though, I mean, the institutional side, of course, is much more interested in the blue chips of crypto, which, of course, would be Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then a, a quickly uh, falling demand after that. And I'm assuming very little interest in NFTs these days. NFTs are, yeah, trying to find kind of their use case. Look, we do a big deal with uh, Nike. Um, and rather than thinking of NFTs as like a cryptocurrency, of course, it's a use case. It's like, how do you build brand loyalty? How do you engage with your community? It's just a different thing. Now, it happens to run with digital property uh, on a blockchain, which is going to open up new doors. But I think, you know, it's an emerging emerging area. But the, co the companies that are in it are actually very excited about it and, and they're moving forward. OK, now you are the pioneer of multi-sig, multi-signature custody. Briefly explain what that is. Sure. Uh, well, well, back in 2012, you know, I was helping a number of people with storing their assets. And as the assets started to grow, you know, I became very concerned about having a failure of my controls of my technology, started to look for a better way. I don't really deserve credit for inventing multi-sig. That's not true. Uh, actually, I just found a corner of the Bitcoin protocol, which is called P2SH. That's technical jargon, stands for pay to script hash which is a feature inside of the Bitcoin protocol where you can now start to have multiple keys that interact to secure assets. So I kind of packaged that up in a way that was logical and made sense. Other people gave me some encouragement. Back in those days, the early developers, Bitcoin Wizards Group, uh, was a very welcoming, uh, it still is, um, but it's a very welcoming early kind of development group. Um, so we led with that, started to productize that. It turns out that businesses, institutions now we call them, all needed that type of security. Okay, and that means that there there's more than one person that has the key. That's like right. That. Security all comes down to, and this is not crypto specific. Security is eliminating single points of failure. So if you had one key, you know, split it into two keys. If you have those two keys on a single machine, split them on two machines. If those two machines are owned by one person, you know, split it on two people and two corporations. The next thing we get to is two jurisdictions or two geographies. You know, we can. We can continue to do that. And of course, you can go from two to three to, and, and more. Um, you're never done with security. 
you just keep raising the bar. And as the size of the asset grows, it's incumbent upon us to the, can you continue to ratchet that up. Right, now you described yourself as a qualified custodian. Where do things stand in terms of regulation and clarity of what is a qualified custodian? And in the digital asset crypto world where we still have a lot of murkiness regarding regulation, is the custodian aspect at least pretty defined at this point? Yeah, look, we hear regulatory clarity is a big issue a lot of the time, but I think there is no regulatory ambiguity when it comes to custody whatsoever. So in the United States, there's a definition of a qualified custodian, um, and it's someone that takes fiduciary duty in custody of assets. Uh, you know, the DTC, which houses all equities pretty much in the United States, it's trillions of dollars flow through it every day. That is a New York State chartered trust company. You know, Bitco is a New York State chartered trust company. So there's no ambiguity about what we do. But I think when it comes to regulatory clarity, an interesting point Regulators, investors, companies, sometimes we call it regulation, but that's a pretty broad sweeping set of things. So if people try to distill it down, you might hear investor protection, right? But investor protection is lots of things. Like number one is how about keep the assets safe so it can't be stolen. And in traditional assets, we don't think about theft of asset that much. I mean, there's a few bank robberies, but this is kind of a solved problem. Now back in 1850, when Wells Fargo had stagecoaches traveling across the United States, that was a real issue, physical storage. Anyway, regulators uh, need to solve kind of that problem. That's where custody fits in. Above that, make sure you don't have fraud, right? So make sure that you have an, a proper accounting for the assets, that you know nobody is mis misappropriating the funds, et cetera. You know, custodians provide that layer on top. There's really no, uh, there's nothing at odds between regulators and custodians in terms of what we're trying to do. The place where we run into ambiguity or disagreements is at the trading level. Once people start trading, you run into like, well, did I get the best price? Was all the information fully disclosed to me? Did I have access to all the markets? Was this guy that's selling it to me dumping it behind his back while trying to pump it over to me? You know, is there insider information in trading? Those are all real issues at the trading level, which causes the regulators to be very concerned. If it's a security, they want to watch that. And it's very important stuff. But frankly, it pales in comparison to just losing the asset at the bottom most layer. And we've had that. I mean, we've had that, unfortunately, with the likes of FTX and Celsius, which served as exchanges and custodians. So where do things stand following that debacle with regards to qualified custodians and more clarity in general? Yeah, well, look, I mean, Sam Bankman fried was operating out of the Bahamas. He was not a registered custodian or a qualified custodian. He had no licenses of any kind. And he was a fraudster. By the way, he's a fraudster, very similar to a guy named Bernie Madoff, which had nothing to do with crypto. So regulators will grapple forever with con men and fraudsters. And they will come from time to time. And sometimes they will get very big, just like Bernie Madoff did, just like Sam Bankman-Fried did. What you do with the regula regulatory stack is you're putting in obstacles that make it much more difficult to perpetrate frauds at that level. And because this isn't very mature in our industry yet, you know, Sam Bankman fried was able to come in and operate and he looked like he was legitimate kind of from a layman's view, but all of the checks and balances were not there. And the one thing that, that could have probably stopped FTX or at least greatly mitigated it, would be just separate the trading and the custody. So this simple check and balance would have made it so that there's at least another party, at least one, that's supposed to see $10 billion of asset there that this guy says he's got. And we probably could have flagged this like way earlier if we had just had that small number. Has there been any impact on custodians though following the FTX collapse and the Celsius collapse? Look, we weren't exposed on that. You know, a custodian's job is around safekeeping of the assets. So you're not generally putting assets out on exchanges. Um, folks who get up into the trading space, those who are doing leverage to, to their clients, they're exposed, but custodians not so much. But you know, we have had a couple of failures in the post FTX world, not directly related. Uh, you know, Prime Trust failed uh, earlier this year, Fortress just failed, uh, I guess last month. And custody is hard. And when it comes to bearer instruments like digital assets and Bitcoin, which is what they are, 
figuring out the security of this is really critical, right? And so we've got companies that haven't taken all of the steps and they're young companies. They haven't taken all the steps that they need to mitigate the various types of risks in terms of digital threats uh, that come into those circles. We're going to circle back to the whole fortress uh, situation, but before we get there, obviously custody is very important when it comes to talking about a Bitcoin spot ETF, which is what the markets are eagerly anticipating because with a spot ETF, there would be physical custody of the asset, of the underlying asset, right? We know that a BlackRock, world's largest asset manager, has applied for a spot Bitcoin ETF, and that's led to more speculation that it will more likely be approved. Coinbase is the registered custodian under that filing. Is the custodian aspect at least something that we can put a check next to in terms of, of what's not holding back a spot Bitcoin ETF filing? That's correct. Um, custody is not, not the issue. Now, when you're talking about Bitcoin in particular, you know, people ask, like, do we need the ETF? What's the purpose of that? Look, there's the decentralized nature of what we do with Bitcoin, um, which is fantastic because everybody in this room and everybody around the planet can have their own wallets, can manage their own funds, etc. Sometimes you're managing money on behalf of others. A lot of people are concerned about how would I store my assets if most of my net worth were in held by myself. This is not an easy problem. Think about how do you not get robbed? How do you not have your house burned down? Do you have appropriate backups? Do you know how to actually digitally maintain this stuff anyway? So we will have businesses that touch digital assets and you don't want just some IT guy that manages all the money and then like he quits and the company loses, loses its assets and it goes under. And similarly, the ETF can start to fill a void where pension funds and you know endowment funds and larger folks that would rather interface with traditional firms would be able to get access to Bitcoin. When you go down the stack of what's needed in order to approve an ETF, custody hasn't really been an issue. We know how to do this. Bitco knows how to do this. Coinbase knows how to do this. The issues have been around some of the trading components, not around the custody components. All right, so at least that part we can say is, is more or less settled. Um, what then do you think is the likelihood of getting a spot Bitcoin ETF? There's some murmurs that this should happen in the first quarter of 2024 what what what's your full cost look i'm i'm optimistic uh there's a number of good players you know valkyrie has been out there i think the longest of anybody with a spot etf application now blackrock a traditional financial firm is very clear they want to go after it i saw a stat i might not have this quite right but in blackrock's history they've had over 500 ETF applications and only ever been rejected once. Yes, that is correct. So, uh, I don't know if it's 500, but I know that they've only been rejected once for every ETF well, application. You guys can, can check that. But the point is they've had a pretty good yeah. success rate. Near perfect rate. We'll record. see how this goes. I mean, look, from, from my spot in the industry, been, been being in here for, for 10 years, there's something that's been happening in the US which is unusual. And under the previous administration, I'm not trying to be political here, you know, just towards the end of his administration, he put in Brian Brooks of the OCC, who then started opening up, you know, crypto into banks. And he said, look, if we're going to have crypto used globally, we want to have our biggest, best, strongest banks be able to help secure that. And that made sense. Now, no legislation changed, no regulation changed. And yet somehow a new administration comes in and the rules changed. So as a business operator, you know, I want to know, like, what are the rules? And we will go meet those rules. But if all that happened is you had a new presidential a president take over and now the rules are interpreted completely different. Like, how do you build business around this? This is a very strange place. To be. So because of that, when it comes to answering the question of will we get an ETF approved, you know, this month or next month? I don't know. There is something which is not related to the regulation or the legislation going on. I don't know what the rules are. So you're, you're still not clear whether a spot Bitcoin ETF will be approved at all in, let's say, in 2024 okay. under the current administration? Look, over time, I definitely think we get one approved. But the objections that have been put down to date, and there's been many and it's been repeated. I don't know how many spot ETF applications have been out there. It's somewhere like 20 or 30, right? They're all rejected for all these various reasons. And now we've got the courts coming in saying that, you know, uh, the SEC is acting in a capricious manner against uh, the GBTC conversion. 
which is very strange. Like, you know, regulators should be just applying the rulebook. Here's what the legislation says. Here's what the regulation says. And here's the answer. This should not, not be ambiguous. So why do you think it is happening like this? Why do you think the SEC and Gary Gensler seem so reluctant to approve a spot Bitcoin ETF and are making things ambiguous and murky well, and it's obvious, capricious? Right? I mean, it's obvious. It's, it's political. It's not actually a matter of law. And that's why it's very difficult to predict whether an ETF is going to be approved. What do you mean by it's political? That means there is political pressure that has nothing to do with what's written or the regulation that's written. And instead, it's about people's influence inside of Washington. So right after uh, Biden was elected, remember Senator Liz Warren showed up and very publicly said, we're going to unwind all that crypto stuff. And she encouraged Biden to do that. Like she's very much in the center of a lot of what's going on with the SEC and also with the Biden administration. There's a political influence that's happening. The laws didn't change, and yet the rules did. How can that possibly happen in the United States of America? Who do you think is behind, then, the pushback against this? Well, we're getting too political here. I mean, you know, I'm not sure who the president of the United States is right now. I think... Uh, I, you're not lot, alone there. there. There's a lot of people that are wondering, like, who's calling the shots? And it's probably a set of people. Um, so let me let me call it there because I don't I don't want to go down the political route. Here's what I think America should strive for. America stri should strive for legislation that sets up regulation and the regulation should have rules that are clear and easy for everyone to understand. And just because you have a new administration, the rules don't change without changing the text. That's where we should be. I think Democrats, Republicans should all be able to get behind that. It's a pretty simple concept. I don't know how we grow the U.S. as being the home for the global economy, the reserve of the currency of the world, if we can't have rules that are predictable and understandable for everyone. All right, sticking a little bit on the political side without uh, overreaching here, BlackRock yeah. is seen, again, as a big political player, given it is the world's largest asset manager. And that's why... When BlackRock got into the spot Bitcoin ETF game, people were saying, okay, well, now it's more likely to get approved because it's BlackRock, because it's Larry Fink, and because it has so much influence globally across the US, tentacles, if you will, everywhere. So wouldn't that sort of negate the political argument if we've got a big player like BlackRock getting in, or that, that it would sway whatever political forces against Bitcoin ETF would be swayed the other direction? Look, there's a threat to democracy, which is regulatory capture, which is where industry can get undue influence into the regulatory and legislative lawmaking process. Um, we all know this happens. Bill Gurley did a great talk on this just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I think when you break down, why is it that we have not had a significant uh, technical evolution of our banking system for the last 30 years when we've seen massive technical explosion in every other industry from the internet to supply chain management to automobiles. Why is it that the, the banking system and our financial system has not changed that much? And it's because of regulation. It's too hard for innovative companies to start and get going without massive amounts of capital. And to say that you know, the folks that do have kind of this moat of regulation around them don't have undue influence is, of course, not correct. So, look, I am super excited and very glad that BlackRock has figured out, wait a minute, this is a place where we can participate and win. Um, and so they're getting into it. I think that's going to help everyone, everyone, all of us. But uh, but yes, of course, they have undue influence. I mean, uh, I don't think that's even up for debate, is it? <laughs> well, no, and hence leads one to think that because they have undue influence, it will be more likely to, to get approval. Well, we hope so. Um, do you think that it's going to be number of Bitcoin EDFs approved at the same time? I mean, that sort of has been the thinking out there. Look, I, I would like to hope so. Um, there's been a number of smaller players. I mentioned Valkyrie already. You know, look, they've been chiseling away at this problem longer than anybody. And there's not really a difference. They are doing exactly the same product that BlackRock is offering, but they're just a smaller footprint. And of course, they don't have the regulatory influence that, uh, that a large company does have. So well, I, I hope so, but I don't know. But is it really such a good thing if we do get the spot Bitcoin ETF approved in the sense of it working against the decentralized ethos? 
of Bitcoin. If Bitcoin is supposed to be accounted to the traditional financial system and it's supposed to be a pure asset, when we have the world's largest asset manager like BlackRock potentially launching a spot Bitcoin ETF and getting it approved and then having centralized custody in a way over the asset and then that asset also being subject to derivatives and futures and all of the things that brought down the traditional financial system, which arguably Satoshi was against. That makes a lot of Bitcoin purists wonder if this is really a good thing. And then when you also start to look at some of the moves by BlackRock to get more control over the Bitcoin ecosystem, I believe that they've uh, now invested in four of the five largest Bitcoin miners by market cap. That's according to uh, data retrieved by Finbolt. So it seems as though BlackRock may be taking over the Bitcoin ecosystem should the spot Bitcoin ETF get approved. Is that actually counter to the Bitcoin mission in its pure sense? Well, let's break this into two problems. One is decentralization, and the other one is you know, how to participate with other markets, the traditional market, whatnot. On decentralization, look, I think most Bitcoiners would say we're still in the experimentation phase. Like we have not figured out how to make decentralization as good as we want it. Even without BlackRock, I think there's too much concentration in the mining industry. Uh, I think pooling creates a threat that Satoshi definitely did not anticipate, uh, you know, kind of growing the way it did. We have a lot of work to do around competing implementations, about really creating an adversarial environment that doesn't end up centralizing a few parties. Totally true. There's work to be done. The good news is we're getting there. And over time, we've continued to meet the challenge. Like I think Bitcoin is really proving that this is doable and is able to avoid some of the pitfalls that are happening with some of the other currencies that are out there that are pretty far down the centralized path. Now, the second thing is like, what about traditional finance? So are we creating a Bitcoin system which excludes those guys because we don't like them? Or are we creating a ubiquitous system that's usable everywhere? And I would argue the goal for Bitcoiners should be that it's accessible everywhere. Retail can have their access to digital assets, Bitcoin, and businesses can run, and you can have a t-shirt shop, or you can have a brokerage shop, or you can have whatever it is. It's about freedom, but everybody's on the same playing field. Everybody's on the same blockchain. Everybody's adversarial against each other. All right, now some people are gonna choose centralized types of products on top of the decentralized blockchain. That will create some threats to decentralization that we haven't had to sort out yet. But when it comes to businesses where they're holding other people's money, you need this. You actually need to take it away from a single person inside of that company that now has control or access. And the only way to do that is to start to build this product. So I think it's a good thing. There are some new threats that we'll have to tackle. No one should think this industry is done. This is not like it's all a solved problem and we're good to go. Like, no, we have to fight for this. And I think if you go back to like the forefathers of America saying, I think it was uh, Ben Franklin said something, uh, we'll give you democracy, hope you can hang on to it, or um, you know, it'll be hard to hold on. I don't have the quote right. But the same thing is true with decentralization. Yeah. We are constantly gonna have pressure that's pushing it back towards centralized forces. And we have to fight them and fight them. And if we ever let up our guard, you know, that part is at risk. So anyway, I think it's two different problems, but we definitely need, I think, traditional finance in. We need businesses to be able to participate. People need to be able to run you know, payment processors and brokers and so on. What would the approval of a spot Bitcoin ETF mean for custodians like Bitcoin? Well, I mean, first and foremost, when you look at the applications, they typically pick kind of one custodian. But when you look at large ETFs or large funds... Has, has BitGo been selected as a custodian for any of the spot Bitcoin ETFs that have been filed? Uh, kind, of, kind of not quite yet. Uh, there's some, some complications about why. We certainly would be qualified to do it. It seems like most have gone with Coinbase or undisclosed. Um, I do think that some of them will come out on BitGo. Um, but uh, my point was, as those things grow, typically you'll see use of multiple custodians. So when you look into the equities world, forget about crypto for a moment, you know, especially post 2008, the SEC wants to see multiple multiple custodians backing any single type of asset. You never want to have all your eggs kind of in one basket. Okay, let's bring it uh, to the price go up people that are always interested in that, away from the libertarian mission of, of uh, Bitcoin, not necessarily away, but focusing on that. Should we get this spot Bitcoin ETF, which again, the thinking is potentially some point next year. We've also got the Bitcoin halving 
next year? I know it's not necessarily your department, but do you have any Bitcoin price forecasts for say, well, mid 2024? Look, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that we're gonna see uh, a very positive next 18 months. I think it's difficult to predict, is it gonna be six months, 12 months or 18 months? Um, but generally I'm, I'm pretty positive. Uh, to be honest, I would actually like to see a bear market continue for 18 to 24 months. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, frothiness still out there. And I think we have a great time to continue to build infrastructure. It's a little bit more under the radar right now. We can get this, the, the parts all assembled and be very strong and come out with a, a really good offering with a little bit more time. So don't mean to depress anybody out there that wants price go up. I, I, I'm perfectly happy with uh, let it sit for a little while. You're saying it sit at what, the, the, the 27 sort of level? Reaching, like what, what is your forecast though? Where, where are you seeing it? Well, like I said, I'm optimistic. I think we're gonna see something significant moved upward. I think we'll, I think we'll retest the previous all time highs within the next 18 months, but I kind of hope that we don't. Okay, to allow you to maybe consolidate and, and continue to build those So like we're building globally. Yeah. Like I said, we got four trust companies across the across the globe, two in the US, two in Europe, two coming in, in Asia and the Middle East. Right. If we can fully connect that, some of our products are coming next about building market structure, about settlement we call the Go Network. We can connect all of these and actually start to create connectivity for global markets in a very safe technology front way. So that's what we're excited about. More time to build that, get rid of some of the projects that are not very good. Um, I think it would be good for all of us. But you're seeing a potential test of the all time high in the next 18 months, you said. Probably. All right. I um, want to quickly get your thoughts on ETH because uh, Kathy Wood, ARK Invest, has also launched an application for a spot ETH ETF. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's great. Uh, I'm sure that the SEC is going to kind of slow roll it for a while, just like they've done with, with Bitcoin. Um, but in general, I mean, I don't know. I think it's a pretty well-traded product globally. I think you got, we've got good markets already. We've got good surveillance and price controls that are doable. We know how to manage this. There's really no reason that product should be banned by the SEC. Kitco News special coverage of Masari's annual Mainit Summit is brought to you by Oasis Pro.